This night is your stretching before the marathon of the conference. Like this is stretching billions of years and billions of meters. Thank you, Bruce. So our final person who's going to present, and then we'll all come up together and you'll have a chance to comment and ask questions, is Ginny Jiko Whitelaw, who is the founder and president of the Institute for Zen Leadership and a Zen master in the Chozen G line of Rinzai Zen. She's a biophysicist. And she was at NASA for 10 years as the Deputy Manager for Integrating the International Space Station, for which she received NASA's Exceptional Service Medal. She holds a PhD in Biophysics as well as a BS in Physics, a BA in Philosophy, and a fifth degree black belt in Aikido, so watch yourself. <laughs> to just like, wow, <laughs> have you been listening to this? <laughs> it's incredible. It's incredible. You know, this is coming full circle for me to come to this conference because I wanted to be an astronaut as a kid. I used to just look up at the stars and be fascinated and feeling this is the hope for the future. And I wrote NASA when I was 13 years old. <laughs> saying, what do I take in junior high school to best prepare me for my life as an astronaut? <laughs> and they wrote back. They actually did write back. And it wasn't a form letter, which was astounding, because in the first paragraph it said, it doesn't matter. <laughs> That's when you know you're not reading a form letter. They said, but you want to take science and math, and, and, uh, and then when you go to college, you want to major in astrophysics or aeronautical engineering or physics. So they give me a whole list. And I cherished that letter, and I put it on my wall. And I followed it to a T. And I took every science and math under the sun and, and, uh, and ended up, after I got out of graduate school, applying to NASA and, went and, and worked there for a number of years, ended up going into management, not into space. <laughs> Um, and got very interested in how leaders and teams would work, which was sort of a change of direction. So I'd like to close our evening of presentations with bringing it back to you and to the human being. Um, just take stock for just a moment. Just take stock of what you're sensing, what your condition is right now. Just for a moment, feel in where you are. And and may I invite you into an experiment with me? Yeah? Because I'd like to make a link between out there and in here. I'd like to make a link between all that we learn and all that we are. So if you would kindly stand up. Stand up. And just shake out the tension. And you've been sitting for a while, right? You've been sitting for a while. All right, yeah, you can shake that out. What I want to do is I want to take three breaths together. But, I, but for this, I'd like to do it a certain way. I'd like you to feel your feet on the earth. Feel your feet on the earth. And just let your weight sink down in gravity. Soften the knees just a little bit. Soften the knees so it's kind of sinking down. That's good. That's good. And I'd like us to be able to just breathe a sigh of relief. Let's just try that. Oh. Ah. Which way did it go? Which way did it go? It goes down. Mm. So as we drop, as we relax the human body, we're naturally drawn into the field of gravity. We're naturally feeling that earth. So let's just take a few breaths together. As we use our hands to guide us, take a breath in. And now just feel your big toes on the earth and breathe down. But nice and slow. Good, let's try it again, even slower. Excellent. And one more. <coughs> just turn your palms out. And just tell me what has changed in the last two minutes. What has changed? Heart rate. 
Heart rate has changed. What else has changed? Energy has changed. What else has changed? Alignment has changed. Can you feel a change in this room? So that's you. What's changed in you? Perception. Perception has changed. What else has changed? Attention, Attention has changed. What else has changed? Calmness. Calmness has changed. Receptivity. Receptivity has changed. How long did that take us? <laughs> that is like one minute. More brain space. <clears throat> so instantly, as we change in here, we change out here. I just draw your attention to something we know because this is where the inner and the outer come together. Where the subjective experience of spiritual development and the outer world of space exploration unite. It's in the human being, in you. And I just invite now, sit down with that same sense of connection. <laughs> and let's kind of put together some of what we've heard tonight some of what we've heard. What I would just note to you is when you change, what we just did in three breaths is we synchronized something in this room, so our signals start to cohere. So energetic signals start to add up in new ways. Signals amplify. Yvonne tells us we are with our environment. Everything we do is in relation. We heard earlier, we need to let our relationships evolve as our science evolves. We are always, moment by moment, vibrating with one another. And when you change how you vibrate with, you change the constellation around you. We just felt it in this room. So this. It's, um, you know, when, when Cassie asked me to talk about how, you know, the spiritual experience, astrophysics, and science come together, you know, I thought about integral theory. How many of you have never heard of integral theory? Yeah, a few of you, and a lot of you know it really well. A lot of you know it well. You know that Ken Wilber did so much work in pulling together the genius of so many other people who studied human development and social development and hierarchies of all kinds to say, what ties all this together? And came up with a model in four quadrants that looks at subjective experience as well as objective. That looks at the I as well as the we. That's what this little model is representing here. A way, it's a kind of a coordinate system, a map to be able to look at anything we want to talk about. So for example, the topics we talk about tonight, the topics you will talk about all weekend, are located on this map. We can see, for example, that we've been talking about objective science versus subjective religious and spiritual experience. One is an exterior dualistic perspective, and the other is a perspective that in its end transcends dualism. It's a mystical unity, a oneness, a samadhi experience in which the molecules of the universe are my own very blood. We've talked about how in the subjective realm we have peak experiences. We could have an astronaut experience like Yvonne could, could speak to. Edgar Mitchell had, oh my gosh, these incredible experiences that come through us. We have also more practices that have emerged in my own experience. They, I learned a lot more about these from Eastern traditions than Western traditions in Zen and Aikido. But practices that cultivate the energy coming through us, energy as a subjective experience, right? From the West, we might look at it more objectively. We treat energy as something you study in physics. I remember walking down the hallway when I was in college, and I saw this little sign that said, high energy physics. I had no idea what that was, but I thought, I want that. <laughs> <laughs> so I walked in, and, I, and I, I found there was a professor there who I actually knew, and so I worked in a high energy physics lab for four years. 
And there you study energy as something that you're penetrating, that you actually get right at the cusp where energy turns into matter, where you come to the truth of what we saw earlier tonight, that in fact everything is energy. But in the, in the Western sense, we're using a method. We're using a scientific method. And we're looking at, at what I'll call rational practices, ways to build on the understanding of one another to get, as I think Brian put it earlier, repeatable experiences. So where do these two things get into conflict? If we say that science and spiritual experience can get into conflict, why? They're looking at the same universe. Why do they get into conflict? In some ways, they can get into conflict because they can be coming out at different stages of development. One's looking at the world very rationally, whereas the other one can start to go to different stages of development that become more unitive consciousness. So they're not, they're not having the same experience. But there is another sense in which there's a unification, and that is that Again, it happens through the human being. It happens through how we literally resonate. How we change the world we're a part of by how we show up in it. Not as something we start apart from, but a part of. Because we are always and at every moment both. So, resonance. What the heck am I talking about? Okay. So here is one example of resonance. You know, a, a, um, a tuning fork. You all can think of a tuning fork where, that, you, that you strike and a doom will have a sound. And if you know anything about resonance, you know that when there's a match in the frequency of vibration, you can get something else moving. So if I were just to shout into a grand piano, all the strings that match my voice would start to vibrate. And likewise you. When you show up in the world, everything that matches you starts to vibrate. So as we, as we look out into the galaxy, it's interesting how many different disciplines talk about resonance, because truthfully, in a physics sense, everything happens through resonance. Resonance is how every change happens. We vibrate with. We vibrate with. And you and I are born resonators. As we just saw beautifully in this talk, we are born of this stuff. And we are a certain kind of a system, a life system, that metabolizes energy to evolve its order. Because of that, we're always taking in energy and doing something with it that makes us resonators. Um, the, uh, this is my astrophysics image here. This happens to be a particular galaxy, MRK820. <laughs> that interestingly is located on the what's called the Hubble tuning fork of galaxies. Talk about resonance, right? The, uh, when I talk about the, uh, the um, vibrations, and we already had this in the room tonight, so I don't have to go over this in great detail or, or detail at all, but when I speak about energy, just to be clear what I'm talking about, in our conventional world, we would say if it's not solid, and it's not liquid, and it's not gas, and we're talking about it, it's a form of energy. So in the world that I work in, and I do a lot of work with leaders all over the world, everything we're concerned with in human affairs is a form of energy. But what's the vibe of a relationship? What's thought? What's, the, what's a team climate? What's executive presence? What's the feeling of showing up and there's just been an argument in the room. These are all energetic forms that we are always registering and doing something with. And we even know that, that solid forms are a form of energy. I mean, Einstein gave us this. And so now for the third time tonight, it brings us to an image of the human being as being an energetic vibrating system within a cosmological sea of energetic vibrations. That's who we are. We're picking up signals that we that match us, just like a tuning fork. And we're doing something with them. What signals do you pick up? And you pick up. And you pick up. What are you picking up? Each of us is picking up some signals in common. We have some common sensory devices. We're picking up some things in common. And each of us pick up some things uniquely. 
that become our purposes, our work in the world, our difference to make, our thing to do. And this process goes on day after day, moment after moment. This way of taking energy and not in, in both studying it objectively, we understand how things like resonance work, how life works, how galaxies form. We understand things out here. And then taking energy and cultivating it personally in this physical body, we're able to conduct it through here. The human being is capable of both. And if this intrigues you, if this is something that you say, yeah, that's the intersection I want to stand in. Yes, there's work, there, there's things you can read and do, and this is, this is obviously what I spend a lifetime on. A book that we're, we'll have even available after this session, The Zen Leader, talks about how to bring this quality of inner and outer coming together into leadership. Um, the, uh, the sneak preview infographic one-page summary of it is even easier to read. And then, <laughs> and then coming, coming on Awake is Resonate, on a book I'm working on right now. And it's also information on that is available. But here's the point. Here's the point. My Zen teacher's teacher would put it this way. The true human body is the entire universe. That's not the ego's body. The ego's body is this skin set that you see in front of you that you have one of two. But the true human body is the entire universe. You and I live a paradox of being universally boundless, limiting, living through a limited self. That is the truth of the human existence. It's a truth that can be both objectively studied and subjectively realized. And when those two come together, you've got what the human being is capable of. Or as Jill Bolt Taylor said, I love this one too, after she had her stroke that was so debilitating that she, uh, you know, uh, had a very a great samadhi experience. She comes out of it saying, we are the power of the universe with hands, manual dexterity. Here we are, the universe available to you and you have a pair of hands and feet to work with. So here's the question, what are you going to do with it? Thank you. All right, so as we bring our panelists up on the stage,